Star Trek Deep Space Nine runabouts. They serve that crucial role of getting characters off the space station and blown up for dramatic effect. Here we'll take a deep dive into these things. We'll cover the story of its creation from its precursor to its concept phase and all the way through to its finished design. There's also a bunch of other stuff crammed in here like the toys and the video games because we may as well since we're already going down this wormhole. If you like the video, I hope I earn your subscription by the end. There's dozens more like it on the channel. So the Bajoran Prophets have brought us together, now let's get going. This is the Runabout Retrospective. There's a little story about how shuttlecrafts even became part of Star Trek. Let's run through that to set the stage for Runabouts. Shuttlecrafts have been a part of the franchise since the very beginning. However, the original series came close to not even having shuttlecrafts. The producers had wanted them for the series, but Desilu, the production house, didn't consider them essential to the show, so they didn't pony up the money to build the sets or miniatures. Along came AMT. They're the company that makes Star Trek model kits, and this is how that came to be. When they approached Desilu for the contract to make Star Trek models, a part of the deal was that they be the ones to cough up the money to construct the sets. And that's what happened. AMT paid the production costs to bring the shuttlecrafts to screen, and they got to sell these. Get to the point. Anyway, back to runabouts. They slot somewhere between a shuttlecraft and a starship. If standard shuttlecrafts were cars, these would be the RVs of Starfleet. For a size comparison, they're about the length of a passenger train car. Height-wise, they're 5.4 meters, which makes them the exact height as something that's 5.4 meters. They accommodate up to a crew of 40. During the design phase, it was conceived that they were modular vessels with three separate sections that could be swapped out depending on the needs of the mission. We'll get into that in more detail in a few minutes. Runabouts lived inside elevating landing pads in DS9's inner ring and were commissioned in 2368. They made their debut in the first episode of DS9. From there, they appeared in every episode of DS9 if you counted the swoosh flyby at the beginning. They also appeared once on The Next Generation and most recently on Lower Decks. There were at least 15 assigned to DS9, all of which were named after Earth Rivers. Overall, they were a jack of all trades. If they could do one thing particularly well though, it was blowing up. Come fly with me, come fly, let's fly away. If you can use some exotic bulls and bombs in far Bombay, You know, the rate we go through runabouts is a good thing the Earth has so many rivers. The runabout's history can be traced to this transport shuttle seen briefly in Star Trek VI, referred to as SD-103. That model was later modified to be the USS Janolan in the episode Relics, where Scotty is found alive after being suspended in a transporter loop for a few decades. What does all this have to do with runabouts? At one point during the development of Deep Space Nine, the Janolan model was considered to become the runabout. Eventually this idea was dropped, but not before its shape and design cues were used as a starting point for the design of what would eventually become the runabout. The basic concept all along was to create a class of vessel somewhere between a shuttle and a starship. Star Trek artists Rick Sternbach and Jim Martin handled the development of the design. Sternbach is probably best known for designing the USS Voyager, and Martin's most notable contribution is the USS Defiant. One of the first design elements finalized were the front cockpit windows. This provided a scale reference for how large the ship would be. Among other things, this was important because the interior sets were scheduled to be completed before the model construction. In this concept, it followed the design cues of the SD-103 very closely with how the sides flanked the cockpit windows. In another concept drawing, the module resembles the module used on the Nebula class ships. That design element was inspired by the airborne warning and control system pod used on actual military aircraft. Like mentioned earlier, this module would make it all the way to the final design as an optional piece. 
Here you can see that at one point they considered putting a deflector array on it. From this concept, you can see the design moving away from the SD-103 and closer to what we eventually saw on screen. At this point, these nacelles are very similar to the type seen on the Type 6 shuttles, particularly the lack of bizarre collectors in front. Remember this for later. Aside from the roll bar module, the actual ship itself developed into something modular. The forward section would always be a cockpit, though it could also serve as an escape pod if necessary, which it never was. When it came time for the model, producers turned to Brazil Fabrication and Design, the same group who constructed the DS9 model. They went with the same hull color as the Enterprise D, which had the added benefit of contrasting with the bronze color of DS9. It was approximately 18 inches front to back, which is about the same size as this. And this would be the only model of the ship for the first six seasons of the show. The runabout had a companion model as well. It was the docking bay platform located on DS9's inner ring. For the launch sequence, the runabout model, the docking bay, and the full-size DS9 model were composited to create these clips. A second physical model was constructed much later in Season 6 for the episode One Little Ship. It's the episode where a runabout gets shrunk by a spatial anomaly. This tiny model is only 6 inches long. Another new model was constructed in Season 6, this time a CG one for the episode Change of Heart. The script called for a runabout flying through an asteroid field. Practical model work would have taken weeks to do, so constructing a CG model only made sense. From here on out, all new runabout shots would utilize this CG model, though stock footage of the original physical model would still appear. In the first episode of DS9, we get to see the detailed boarding process. We see Dax and Cisco exit with the circular DS9 doors behind them, then board the runabout. Here's another instance of great attention to detail, with both the outer and inner doors of the runabout. Well, here we are talking about unappreciated doors. Where do we go from here? In DS9, when they couldn't think of an end to a scene, they just plug in some mini cliffhanger and cut to commercial. Will these doors ever be seen again? Not. Humble Quark at your service. Behold, Star Trek Deep Space Nine action figures. Commander Benjamin Sisko, he helps me run the station. And Security Chief Odo, very strict and sneaky for someone so honest. Here's Lieutenant Dax, Chief O'Brien, and Major Kira Nerys. I happen to know she's crazy about me. Wonderful, aren't they? Especially this one. So handsome. Pains me to part with it, but if you pay me now, ah, security. What a pleasant surprise. <laughs> Yeah, a few more times. So with the interior, we mainly saw the cockpit, which had four workstations facing forward and two more on the sides. Behind the workstations was a transporter pad and a food replicator. The runabout cockpit set was renovated for the Dominion War. The transporter and replicator were moved farther back to accommodate additional workstations. The aft module sometimes featured living quarters, the first time we see this is actually on The Next Generation in the episode Timescape. This worked out well because the construction costs came from the TNG budget, which was much higher than DS9's. Basically DS9 got a free set out of this. There's some more great attention to detail with the windows. Not just in the back, but along the sides, which match up with these windows from the model. So the set designers really nailed this one. A full-sized exterior runabout set piece appeared as well. When this one crash lands on the planet, we see the port side escape hatch used. It's a weird spot for an escape hatch, because the door's right here. From the looks of it, this is the finished design of the runabout. The only thing that stands out is this nacelle. As you can see, it's not the same nacelle that's featured on the model. This one looks like it comes from the June 1992 concept art, but this was the 13th episode filmed for season one. So by this point, all the runabout design would have been finalized. It's likely it was just cheaper to use an existing nacelle prop than building a new one for this one-time use. This nacelle is the same one that's used on a few of the next generation shuttlecrafts. Like many Star Trek sets, the runabout cockpit set was redressed as other locations a few times. 
In the season 3 episode, Through the Looking Glass, which takes place in the Mirror Universe, the cockpit set was redressed to portray that of a Terran fighter. It's a fairly heavy redress with some work panels replacing the side windows and dark trim added throughout. In the opening scene of Voyager's premiere episode, where the Maquis Raider is evading a Cardassian cruiser, the set served as the Raider's cockpit. A few set dressing pieces were added to the wall, but otherwise it's the runabout cockpit without much added. The set would be used again in the Voyager episode Non Sequitur, which takes place in an alternate timeline where Harry Kim was never on Voyager when it was thrown into the Delta Quadrant. In this timeline, Harry Kim modified a runabout with a new warp drive system. It's a Yellowstone class ship named the USS Yellowstone. The interior and exterior sets are exactly the same as the Danube class, no changes. There's a random connection with USS Janolan here. When Harry Kim and Tom Paris are stealing the Yellowstone from Space Dock, the Space Dock doors are a reuse of the Dyson Sphere doors from the episode Relics that featured the USS Janolan. The set was heavily redressed and modified for Star Trek Insurrection in 1998. The forward windows were reshaped and smaller windows were added on the sides. The side windows farther back on runabouts were replaced with displays. The panels were also slightly modified with new graphics. The runabout interior sets were housed in Paramount Studios Stage 18, which are where the USS Defiance sets were as well. This stage would later be used for the NX-01 interior sets, and even used for the 2009 Star Trek movie. Deep Space Nine had a few video games, and runabouts were featured in those as well. They appeared in 1995's Crossroads of Time, released on the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive if being an American is near thing. The game has a whole stage dedicated to it where you fly through the wormhole. The idea is to avoid touching these energy waves. The wormhole's interior looks like it does on the show, and overall the graphics are pretty good for the time. In Harbinger from 1996, we get an FMV of the cockpit, then the first stage of the game has you fixing something so that a runabout doesn't blow up. Yeah, and good luck with that. DS9 also got a toy line that included a runabout vehicle. For the most part, it's exactly as it appears on the show. The front windows are in a weird spot though. It's so that they match the eyeline of the figure inside. And just like the show, there's also a compartment in the rear for another figure or whatever else Starfleet packs into starships. That's the video! I hope you liked it, consider subscribing, it helped the channel achieve its goal of being the ninth most popular Star Trek channel about starships. Great, I'd like to thank these folks for supporting the channel, I really appreciate it, I'll catch you in the next video.